Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is an interesting one on the Gospel of Mark. Hmm. You would have thought that we everything that needed to be said about Mark has already been said, right? Well, this is lesson number four in our series on the Gospel of Mark for July 27 of 2024. And we'd like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father is, you look down on us and you remember the experiences you had with Peter, whose gospel we are now studying, who was written down by John Mark. And we wonder how each one of those people contributed something to the story. And now we have a Sabbath school lesson, a series written by somebody else who contributed. And now we're trying to gain the insights that are available to us. May we see in this lesson what you want us to see is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus often taught in parables. So I'm going to stop and ask you with all your Webster's packed away in the back of your, uh, your brain there, what's a parable? A teaching story. A teaching, that's pretty good. Literally, parable means to throw down beside. So here's your story, and you're throwing something to the side that's more or less parallel to that thing. That's what parable me literally means. So why did he? Why did Jesus do that, Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, this study is on the parables in Mark 4. The Gospel of Mark has the fewest parables of any of the synoptic gospels, that is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For many years, scholars have argued over the meaning and interpretation of Jesus' parables, how to interpret what they mean, why Jesus used them, what kind of lessons they were intended to reveal, and how literally they were to be taken, or whether they were purely allegory, and so forth. Obviously, we are not going to solve all these issues in this lesson. Instead, we are going to look at them and, by God's grace, come away with an understanding of the points Jesus made through these parables. From, this is from the Bible Study Guide. Okay, as we study the parables of Jesus in Mark 4, we note an important motif or a dominant idea, <clears throat> the kingdom of God. Okay, right up front now, you should think of two things when someone says kingdom of God. What two things can you think of? Immediately. Think of heaven. Okay, heaven is obvious. Place where God lives. Okay, that's another way to say heaven, I guess. Really, the other times, if, if you take the examples of the Bible, the disciples thought the kingdom of God was here because Jesus was here. So this theme was introduced in Mark, first in Mark 1, 14 and 15, quote, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. From our, translated from the New American Standard Bible. So what is the significance of the kingdom of God as presented in Mark? The pursuit of the answer to this question will be the main topic of our discussion. An understanding of this motif and its significance will help us better understand Jesus' parables. Okay, we'll see how that works out. Uh, so let's start. Charles, and there's some prints there if you prefer the, the printer. Yeah, it's, it's, I have it on the side. Uh, okay. He's done with first, right? I mean, second. Mark 4 uh, there, under Mark number four. 2. Right, right, great. Mark 4 has just five parables, just five. The sword, the lamb, the measure, the growing seed, and the mustard seed. The majority of the chapter revolves around the parable of the sword. This parable is told first followed by the reason for the parables, and then the interpretation of the parable. This three-step pattern will be the focus of the studies for most of the lesson. Then the other parable will be the subject of the rest of the study. Okay, Gordon, let's jump in there. Mark 4, verses 1 through 9 from the Good News Bible. Again, Jesus began to teach beside Lake Galilee. The crowd that gathered round him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it. The boat was out in the water and the crowd stood on the shore at the water's edge. 
He used parables to teach them many things, saying to them, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I should have done this a moment before earlier. Ellen White, in our, almost in our day, at one time preached to a crowd of 5,000 people. No amplification, no anything of any kind. How is that possible? Because I think here's Jesus, and I know there's a nice amphitheater, natural amphitheater, not too far from, Gal uh, from uh, Capernaum, which is probably where Jesus was. But even so, I mean, if it's 1,000 or 2,000, he's preaching outside. And they're standing. It yeah. Says. Or, or sitting down on the grass. But that would make it worse because the, all, the, all the growth and so forth would tend to absorb sound. So how, do, how did that happen? Is, is God doing some magic behind the scenes here? Well, we later have the parable of the, or not the parable, the miracle of the ears mm -hmm. in Acts, mm -hmm. where people heard in their own language what mm -hmm. the apostles spoke. So maybe God amplified the sound here for those who had trouble hearing like, like us old I, people. I don't know any other explanation for something. That, I, I mean, have you ever tried to, I mean, to try to speak to 50 people, not 5,000? Yeah. Now, we've got more ambient noise these days with airplanes and trains and cars and all kinds of nonsense going on. But even so, anyway, sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. I quite spoke here in Loma Linda to yeah. large groups of people right here. Yeah, it's true. Right. She did. Verse 3, listen, once there was a man who went out to sow corn or grain. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell on rocky ground where there was little soil. The seeds soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep. Then when the sun came up, it burned the young plants, and because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seed fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants, and they didn't produce any corn. But some seeds fell in good soil, and the plants sprouted, grew, and produced corn. Some had 30 grains, others 60, and others 100. And Jesus concluded, listen then if you have ears from the Good News Bible. Okay, and we need to speak up here and say that corn to a British, this is a British translation, corn means wheat. That's, that's would be a little confusing for some Americans. We can see in these parables without jumping immediately to the interpretation that Jesus gave. What can we see? I'm sorry. Clearly in the parable of sower, the key factor is the type of soil, right? Clearly that is the main influence on how the seed produces or does not. It is interesting to notice that the length of time for completing the details of each seed story uh, le lengthens with each successive type of soil. The birds pick up the soil, cast, picks up this, uh, this is says soil. That's interesting. The seed cast on the path, because that's copied straight out of the Bible. Birds pick up the seed cast on the path almost immediately. The seed that falls on the rocky ground springs up for just a few days and then dies. The seed that falls on the weedy soil grows up for some time, but is choked by the weeds. Finally, the seed that fails on the good so falls on the good soil grows up for the full period of time until the crop is mature. I so, have a question. You said that the, main, the key factor is a type of soil. Hmm. Uh, I hate to take a parable too far, but was the sower of the seed careful enough where he put the seed? Yeah, good question. Should he have, he or she, but he, have been more careful about not throwing it on the hard soil or the rocky ground? Well, the response that the Bible will give you is that God sows his seed everywhere, intentionally. That's what the Bible would say. But uh, I have watched this being done, by the way, so mm -hmm. it's yeah. bound to fall. Yeah. It is bound to fall because 
they, they literally do this. They'll walk and they'll go very fast, yeah. you know, and pretty evenly they do it and some of it will fall on the path. Maybe they need to be more careful. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay, Myra. Well, I'm just thinking about the wildflower seeds that I threw out. That's what I did. But I was careful in that I made sure I did it just before it rained so the birds could get it all before it <laughs> There you gone. go. <laughs> okay, from the Bible study guide. Three of the stories are about failure. Only one is about success, <coughs> an abundant crop. The length of the stories, the longer and longer period of time for each successive story. And the fact that only one story is about success all point to the risk of failure, but the abundant outcome of success. Mm. The parable seems to point to the cost of discipleship and the risks involved, but it also highlights an abundant reward in following Jesus. Okay, what are the risks of discipleship? Mm. I would have been inclined to say not just discipleship there, I would have put witnessing because we well, you know, you can go out there and you can go to every door and so forth and you're not going to get a very big response. But when you do, it's exciting. Well, rejection is the name of the game, so. Yeah. In some countries, witnessing means you lose your life if you're caught. Yeah. Also. Certainly at some times in the past and sometimes currently. Yeah. Clear the, clearly, the different types of style represent different types of responses to the gospel. That's pretty clear. Why do people respond differently? In Mark 4, verse 1 and verse 10, we read that Jesus had been presenting his gospel to a large crowd. But when it came time to discuss the interpretation, they had gone away or he had been dismissed them. We don't know what happened exactly. He spoke only to his disciples and a few other friends who heard the interpretation. So that raises more questions. Jim? Mark, chapter 4, verses 13 to 20. Then Jesus asked them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you ever understand any parable? The sower sows God's message. Some people are like the seeds that fall along the path. As soon as they hear the message, Satan comes and t takes it away. Other people are like the seeds that fall on rocky ground. As soon as they hear the message, they receive it gladly but it does not sink in deep into them, and they don't last long. So when the trouble or persecution comes because of the message, they give up at once. Other people are like the seeds sown among the thorn bushes. These are the ones you hear who hear the message, but the worries about this life, the love for riches, and all the other kinds of desires crowd in and choke the message, and they don't bear fruit. But other people are like the seeds sown in good soil. They hear the message, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some 100. 100. Good News Bible. Okay, does that mean they, they won 100 people to the truth, or 60 people to the truth, or 30 people to the truth? Don't take it too literally. Okay. We have to be careful about Over. interpreting every detail. We, we're, look, we're supposed to look at the big picture, I think we're, okay. we're going to say. Jesus was not trying to describe every possible reaction that could happen when a person hears the gospel. Clearly, the seed in this story represents God's word, the good news. The longest explanations are for the rocky ground and the weedy ground. In describing the rocky ground hearers, Jesus points to the contrasting elements, they receive the word with joy, but are temporarily, temporary disciples. When the persecution comes, they fall away. The weed ground hearers are, the, are a contrast. They do not fall away because of hard times, but because of good times. Their focus is on the things of the world instead of the kingdom of God. Their cares, our concerns resolve revolve around what the world has to offer, what the world has to offer. Okay. So how do you think you, you respond to hearing new truths from God's Word? 
You sometimes respond in different ways to different truths. Are there some truths that you have a hard time with? Yeah, well, who presents it? If a Jehovah's Witness comes and knocks at the door, we're already biased. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's always good to listen to. Maybe that's what people of other denominations say when the seventh day. Oh, absolutely. Yes, door. sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. In connection with his explanation about using parables, Jesus made these statements. Mark 4, verses 10 through 12. When Jesus was alone, some of those who had heard him came to him with the 12 disciples and asked him to explain the parables. You have been given the secret of the kingdom of God, Jesus answered. But the others who are on the outside hear all things by means of parables so that, quote, they may look and look yet not see. They may listen and listen yet not understand. For if they did, they would turn to God and he would forgive them. Hmm. And the good so news sad. Bible. And this seems like an obvious reference to Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. Myra? Uh from Isaiah. So he, the heavenly messenger, told me to go and give the people this message. No matter how much you listen, you will not understand. No matter how much you look, you will not know what is happening. Then he said to me, make the minds of these people dull, their ears deaf and their eyes blind, so they cannot see or hear or understand. If they did, they might turn to me and be healed. Wow. Hmm. Does this interpretation suggest to you that Jesus had picked out a, a few favorite hearers to give his message to while everybody else was rejected as an outsider? Was Jesus intentionally trying to keep outsiders in the dark? Well, a surface reading, this is from our Bible study guide, a surface reading of these verses might give the impression that Jesus taught in parables to keep outsiders in the dark. But such a perspective does not fit with Jesus' actions elsewhere in Mark. In Mark 3, 5, and 6, Jesus is grieved by the hard hearts of the religious leaders. In Mark 3, 22 to 30, Jesus takes the argument of the scribes seriously and explains in detail why they are mistaken. So if, if he knew, okay, I don't care about those people at all, why, why bother with them? But he, 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 even these people were so almost obnoxious. He had a careful time to, to explain it to them. In Mark 12, 1 through 12, the religious leaders understand that Jesus' parables are, of the tenets is about them. It is actually a warning of whether, where their plot against him is heading and the terrible consequences to follow. If he had no concern for them, he would not warn them. Consequently, Jesus' words here in Mark 4 need a closer look in order to recognize what his point is. Jesus is paraphrasing Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Okay, so, Jim, Mark 3 there. Mark 3, verse 22 to 30. Some teachers of the law and who come, excuse me, who had come from Jerusalem were saying, he has Beelzebul in him. It is the chief of the demons who gives him the power to drive them out. So Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a country divides itself, uh, itself into groups which fight each other, that country will fall apart. If a family divides itself into groups which fight each other, that family will fall apart. So if Satan's kingdom divides into groups, it will not last, but will fall apart and come to an end. No one can break into a strong man's house and take away his belongings unless he first ties up the strong man then he can plunder the house his house i assure you that people can forgive all their can be can be forgiven all their sins and all their evil things they may say but whoever says evil things against the holy spirit will never be forgiven because he is committed and it, he has committed an eternal sin. Jesus said this because some people were saying he has an evil spirit in him. So in the context of all the other miracles that surround Mark 4, we remember several people had demons cast out of them. So who's breaking into whose house and stealing? 
Jesus is breaking into the devil's house and taking away his captives, right? Freeing, freeing them. He was giving them information that, uh, in fact, uh, another text that I haven't seen here, but maybe you do have it. John 9, 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world that they which night, excuse me, that they which see not might see and they that which see might be made blind. Yeah. But uh, for judgment. And it isn't judging. No, it's to give you something, it's a, a, some information that is different from what everybody else has ha been exposed to. So you get a chance so to make So you can it. make a choice. Yeah. Choice has to uh, judgment or separation. So if there was any group of people that did not seem like good soil hearers, it certainly would be the demon-possessed people of his day, right? But whenever Jesus cast out demons, he was breaking into Satan's house and setting Satan's captives free. So that along with other passages strongly suggests, suggested that Jesus intended to read out, reached out to everyone who will listen. But unfortunately, as we know, there were hearers who were dead set against accepting the messages of Jesus. So now we go to the passage in Mark 12. 1 to 12, then Jesus spoke to them in parables. Once there was a man who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he laid out the vineyard to tenants and left home on a journey. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent a slave to the tenants to receive from them his share of the harvest. The tenant seized the slave, beat him, and sent him back without, without a thing. Then the owner sent another slave, and the, the tenants beat him over the head and threatened, uh, treated him shamefully. The owner sent another slave, and they killed him. And they treated many others the same way, beating some and killing others. Wow. The only left, the only one left to send was the man's own dear son. Last of all, then, he sent his son to the tenants. I am sure they will respond, mm. respect my son, he said. But those tenants said to one another, this is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him and his property will be ours. So they seized the son, killed him, and threw his body out of the vineyard. <laughs> what then will the owner of the vineyard do? Asked Jesus. He will come and kill those tenants and hand the vineyards over to the others. Surely you have read this, this scripture, scripture. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. The Jewish leaders tried to arrest Jesus because they knew that he had told this parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. <laughs> what do you do if you're standing in a crowd and they're telling a parable that's very unfavorable and it's against you. And these are the big bosses. Mm -hmm. They were the big bosses. Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Jesus was getting pretty... Bold? I say, bold, I guess that's the right word. Bold here, isn't he? Yes. So how could Jesus welcome some formerly demon-possessed individuals while the religious leaders rejected him? Compare the following story in Isaiah 6. We're going back to Isaiah again. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on, a, on his throne, high and exalted, and his robe filled the whole temple. Round him flaming creatures were standing, each of which had six wings. Each cr creature covered its face with two wings, and its body with two, and used the other two for flying. They were calling out to each other, Holy, 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 the Lord God. Almighty is holy. His glory fills the world. The sound of their voices made the foundation of the temple shake, and the temple itself was filled with smoke. I said, there is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful, and I live among a people whose every word is sinful. 
And yet, with my own eyes, I have sent the King, the Almighty. I've seen the King. I have seen the King, the Almighty, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me, carrying a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, This has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord say, Whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? I answered, I will go, send me. So he told me to go and give the people this message. No matter, how, and this is what we read earlier, no matter how much you listen, you will not understand. No matter how much you look, you will not know what is happening. Then he said to me, make the minds of these people dull, their ears deaf and their eyes blind, so that they cannot see or hear or understand. If they did, they might turn to me and be healed. I asked, how long will it be like this, Lord? He answered, until the cities are ruined and empty, until the houses are uninhabited, until the land itself is a desolate waste, I will send the people far away and make the whole land desolate. In parentheses, in verse 13, the stump represents a new beginning for God's people from the Good News Bible. Yeah. So this is about almost 100 years, this statement that Isaiah, we just read from, um, before Judah was finally conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and his people were exiled. And what's he trying to say here? I mean, imagine going to the temple and everybody's coming to church on Sabbath morning, to the temple on Sabbath morning, and you're reading this passage to them. And they're saying, what? I mean, this is certainly no way to win a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. Isaiah saw a vision of God in the temple and was overwhelmed by God's glory and his own uncleanness. God cleansed him and commissioned him with a shocking message. Just like Mark, it sounds out of step with the rest of Isaiah in which there is comfort for God's people. From My? the Bible study guide. In Isaiah 6, the message is meant to shock the people awake so that they will turn from their evil ways. In Mark, the key for understanding Jesus' words are found in Mark 3, 35. To understand Jesus' words and teaching, <laughs> one must do the will of God, Mark 3:35. This brings that person into a family, into the family of Jesus. Those who have already decided that Jesus is possessed by the devil will not listen. I, I sometimes feel sorry for the scribes and Pharisees. And every time they faced Jesus, he, he just tied them up in knots, you know? Fortunately, some of them finally got the message because we read in Acts 6, 7 and Acts 15, 5 that a large number of priests and a number of Pharisees became Christians. But, <laughs> you know, they deserved what they got. There's no question about that. Well, seven times he called them hypocrites. Yeah. <laughs> it, should be, Matthew. yeah it should be clear by comparing Mark with Isaiah 6 that some people are not kept out but rather have kept themselves out by their preconceived ideas. Of course, none of us will have that problem, right? So their heaven is self-selected, is it not? How do you respond to the truth when it is presented to you? What if it is in conflict with one of your favorite beliefs? Well, how, are we, how well are we doing it at a church, as a church, in presenting the gospel to the world around us? Well, let's talk about now about the parable of the lamp. Jim? This is from Mark uh, chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Jesus continued, Does anyone ever bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or under the bed? Doesn't he put it on a lampstand? Whatever is hidden away will be brought out into the open, and whatever is covered up will be uncovered. Listen then if you have ears. Surely the answers to Jesus' questions must be obvious to everyone. God intends for the good news to be presented to every individual on this earth, if possible. 
but not everyone's going to respond, at least respond positively. We are condemned if we hide our lamp under a bushel or under a basket. This business of good news, we use that term so commonly, but really what does it mean? Is it, a, is, it, is it a good news? Okay, so I heard some good news and you go on with your life. Or is it a news or message that can make you good? Well, that's one possible Is there some meaning. efficacy to that, to, to, to that point of, uh, of yeah. reading the text? <clears throat> Isn't the good news the gospel? Yes. Yeah, but just, yeah. just to hear something, it's, a, uh, it's in a, a list of all, uh, or a, uh, many different philosophies, but this is one that has something that uh, can benefit, not yes. just yourself. Okay, turning to the topic of being fair to others, and God can be fair with us. Mark 4, 24, 25, he also said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The same rules you use to judge others will be used by God to judge you, but with even greater severity. Those who have something will be given more, and those who have nothing will have taken away from them even the little they have. Goodness, Bible. And from the Bible study guide, in many locations in the world, fresh produce is sold in open markets. Sellers typically have a device for measuring the products they are selling. It is a common practice of such sellers to add just a little bit to a sale to help the buyer feel he or she is being treated fairly. That's not what it is in all areas of all countries. No. Sometimes they have cheating scales. He talks, he talks about that elsewhere. Jesus picks up on how good uh, sellers treat buyers to make a point about openness to the truth. If one is open and follows the light, he or she will get even more. But if he or she rejects the light, even what they had before will be taken away. How can we better understand the principle that with what measure you use, it will be measured to you? Think about it in all your dealings with others from the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. Okay. Now we explore the mystery of God making the seeds grow and the growing process. From Mark 4, to, verses 26 to 29. Jesus went on to say that the kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed in his field. He sleeps at night, is up and about during the day, and, while, and all the while the seeds are sprouting and growing. Yet he does not know how it happens. The soil itself makes the plants grow and bear fruit. First the tender stalk appears, then the ear, finally the ear, uh, ear full of corn. Then the corn is ripe. When the corn is ripe, the man count starts cutting it with his sickle because harvest time has come. Okay, so now let's talk about, we're talking about Mark now, we're talking about this gospel. What do we know about it? Most, that is 90% of the Gospel Mark has parallels in either Matthew or Luke or both. But that is not the case with this parable. It is unique to Mark. The focus of this brief parable is the growing process. Jesus indicates that this is how the kingdom of God works. Humans have a part to play. And we need to think about what our part is. But the real growth is the work of God. It is not an endless process. The story comes to an abrupt end with the maturation of the grain, just so the return of Christ a second time will suddenly bring an end to our world's history from the Bible Study Guide. Jesus was beginning his ministry in Galilee when these parables were spoken. It probably seemed to people like there was only a very small group of people interested in hearing what he had to say, and even fewer who were willing to follow him. Jim? Back to you again. Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Asked Jesus. What parable shall we use to explain it? It is like this. A man takes a mustard seed, the smallest seed in the world, and plants it in the ground. 
After a while, it grows up and becomes the biggest of all plants. It puts out such large branches that the birds come and make their nest in its shade. Okay. So this parable stresses how something very tiny goes into something remarkably large. And we've talked about this before, especially in the context of Ephesians 4, where it talks about growth. And I've asked this question, I will ask it again. What is the most important characteristic of a child? The capacity to grow. The capacity to grow, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. Capacity to grow, yeah, exactly. Mustard seeds measure typically one to two millimeters in diameter, 0.039 to 0.079 inches, pretty small. The plant described here is probably the black mustard, the Brassica nigra, where, which has tiny seeds, more than 700 seeds in one gram. Mm. That's a That's lot small. of seeds. While not the smallest seeds in the world, they are quite small, especially in comparison to the plant they produce, which can grow as large as three meters, 10 feet tall. Jesus notes that the birds even nest in the branches of the mustard plant. This last reference is an allusion to Psalm 104, verse 12, which in turn has it was another allusion to Daniel 4, verses 10 through 12 as well. Psalm 104 speaks of God's power in creating the world, and Daniel 4, uh, represents Nebuchadnezzar as a great tree under which all the world finds shade and food. So, sometimes when I see them pointing out these similarities to Old Testament passages, I think about this. Our English language is largely, the common language we use, is very largely based on two major works that happened in the 15th well, really, the 16th and 17th century. Shakespeare Kindle. and the Bible. Shakespeare and the Bible d determined what would be the words that we use and how we use them, as a, and a lot of other stuff that we used to use fa has fallen away, basically. So I look at this and I say, okay, what, what vocabulary did they have to work with? The Bible, that was, their, that was their book. That's what they studied in school, et cetera, et cetera. So of course they're gonna use examples from the Bible. That seems obvious to me. I don't, how does it grab the rest of you? The point that Jesus makes is that the kingdom of God, which began very small, will become large and impressive. People will, people in Jesus' days may have looked down on the dusty itinerant preacher from Galilee with his band of disciples, but time has shown that his kingdom of grace continues to expand throughout the world. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come, Matthew 24, 14. Consider what the church was like when Jesus made that Mm. Why is this such a remarkable and faith-affirming prediction? Yeah. He, you know, he, he's speaking to 11 disciples. Judas has already left them. And he says, you're going to take the kingdom to the whole world. I, what if I said to you, well, you get, you, well there's five of us. We, take, we, can take the king, we can take the gospel to half a world. You're going to look at me like, what kind of craziness are you talking about here? The internet, we can take it to the whole world. Well, that's a little different now. But they, look, none of the 11 mm -hmm. were on salary. No. 10 of the 11 died at the hands of others, we yes. are told. Mm. They were passionate. Yes. And I, I believe that the time is here when it's going to happen again. Yeah. They weren't like the priests and the prophets of uh, Jeremiah 6.13, were they? They were motivated by greed. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Please. Well, why not? <laughs> Let, let's, let's face it, Jesus talked pretty plain. Why can't we talk plain? I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <we don't. laughs> I'm jobless, see? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what did Ellen White have to say about love and serving others? 
She said, true holiness is wholeness in the service of God. This is the condition of the true Christian living. Christ asks for an unreserved consecration for undivided surface. He demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength. Self is not to be cherished. He who lives in himself is not a Christian. Love must be the principle of action. Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian character. This alone can make, the, make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. And love will be revealed in sacrifice. The plan of redemption was laid in sacrifice, a sacrifice so broad and deep and high that it is immeasurable. Christ gave all for us, and those who receive Christ will be ready to sacrifice all for the sake of their Redeemer. The thought of His honor and glory will come before anything else. In Christ's Object Lessons, page yes. 48. And there's a link. If you have the, uh, this handout, if you go to our, our website at theox.org, that's T-H-U-X.org, you can download this, and if you click on that link, you can see the full context of that passage. Many of us are reluctant to try to evangelize the people around us. We tend to withdraw and think that that is the pastor's job. Well, what do we learn from Mark 4, 26, 29, quoted above? Jesus said we're supposed to take all of us, we're supposed to take the message where, how far? Yeah. To the whole world, right? As Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, he realized that his time on this earth was growing short. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a lot, not nearly as young as I used to be. And I tend to think a little bit more, okay, how many more years am I going to survive? But imagine Jesus knowing every day he knows, okay, I have this many more days, I have this many more days, I have this many more, more you know. Hmm. Well, as far as we know, the only a few people realize the meaning of Daniel 9, 25 through 27, and that the 490 year or 70 week prophetic time had come to an end, and Jesus is represented in Mark 1, 15 as almost starting with that idea. So how long, how did long did it take him to figure out Daniel 9? So what does it say there? Mark 1, 15. The right time has come, he said and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. Okay. Now, if we had a lot of time and I wanted to add some extra verses, we would go to Galatians 4, verse 4, where it says what? Now is the time, basically. Yeah. Um, but Jesus had already spent more than a year trying to work in the area of Judea. Although we know very little about what he did during that time, and what we know is mostly from John's Gospel, there is no evidence that there was a big response to his preaching during that time. As Jesus approached his ministry in Galilee, he knew the time had come, the kingdom of God was among them. So in other words, what do you do? You're running out of time. Well, what did Jesus mean by spreading, speaking about the kingdom of God, and what did he mean by the time is fulfilled. Jim? <clears throat> the idea of the kingdom of God is made promised, prominent from the start of Mark's gospel. Mark 1.15 states, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And read uh, many references to there. And then hence, the kingdom of God is a recurrent theme in the gospel of Mark. Obviously, a lot of references to the kingdom of God. But where did Jesus get the idea that the kingdom of God was supposed to be coming? Well, we've already mentioned Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and what is that all about? It's, that's about the final week in the 70-year prophecy, isn't it? What's going to happen at that time? If we back up to where it says kingdom of God, what is, what is ever, God, everything God has done, or the primary focus, everything that God has done, since we Way began back. to create, was to have a harmony in his creation, a state of at one -ment. 
Mm -hmm. But then religions have taken this and they talk it to, to atone, which is a made up, it, it's from a, from a word that uh, Tyndale made up apparently, at one meant mm -hmm. to become into a state of harmony. Mm -hmm. If everybody's in a state of harmony, you don't have wars and killing and so on and so forth. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So if we turn, well, we've already mentioned Daniel 9, 24 to 27 talks about the week, the prophetic week that involved Jesus and his crucifixion in the middle, then to finally the rejection of the Jewish people as God's prophetic people and the gospel spread to Gentiles, etc. all in those two, three verses there. Yes, but, I just cannot help yeah. it, but I am, when the Reformation came, and the gospel was spreading so fast. Um, the Jesuits were created. Um, I'm sorry, what was? Jesuits. Okay. Uh, Iglesia Loyola and mm -hmm. Francisco Rivera. Mm -hmm. And they came up with an idea. It says, let's do this. This seven, the seven weeks, no, seven days, right? Divided it to half. And they put it preteristic and futuristic and mm. have divided and have destroyed, in a sense, Protestants. Yeah. The devil has thought of so many ways to try to twist these, Doing very well. these prophecies. Anyway, if we go back earlier to Daniel 7, 13 to 14, we'll look at that in just a moment. We realize that the power that had been dominating the world was going to be overcome and replaced by a completely different kind of kingdom that will last forever. Immediately we have an idea what kind of kingdom that is. And that kingdom will include the saints. Charles? Yes, sir. Daniel 7, 13, 14. During the vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority honor and royal power so that the people of all nations, races and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. Amen. Let us consider the important implications of these future events. First, that little horn will lose its authority over the saints. Second, that judgment means the vindication of God's people, the saints. The kingdom of God is not an isolated kingdom confined to heavenly realms only. The kingdom of God includes the saints. In other words, it is the kingdom of God's people. Okay, so who's supposed to be a part of that kingdom? Oh. Us. We, we. we are supposed to. If you want a question about that, go to Ephesians 1, 7-10. Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and you'll see that it's the entire universe that are involved here, and we are supposed to be the primary witnesses for what's going on. So in fact, Jesus is calling himself the fulfillment of that prophecy, but he recognized that there was more to come, and Peter picked up that, picked that up. In 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, for you know what it was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors. It was not something that can be destroyed, such as silver or gold. It was the costly sacrifice of Christ, who was like a lamb without a defect or flaw. He had been chosen by God before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last days for your sake. Good News Bible. Okay. So the time being fulfilled, what more do we know about that? Mark, um, the Bible study guide, Mark 1, 14 and 15 states that Jesus came to Galilee proclaim, proclaiming good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. These verses provide many important elements for our consideration. First, the essence of Jesus' preaching was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is explicitly referred to in Matthew 4, 23. Jesus is going about in all of Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. That's first. Second? Second, the content of his proclamation was 
eschatology oriented. The time is fulfilled. The time is Mark. What time is Mark referring to here? It must be the time of the last week of the 70 week prophecy in Daniel 9. One scholar noted. Oh, oh go ahead. One scholar noted the gospel of Mark has been identified as the gospel of the fulfilled time. And there's the references there. How should we understand the expression, the kingdom of God has come near? And I like to think of it like this. We have the Bible that covers somewhere around 1,500 years of, of history. And we can read that through that, and we can understand, we can learn from it, and we can discover the truth about God and his character. But then Jesus comes smash in the middle, of that, not, ma not smash in the middle chronologically, but sort of in the middle in terms of the, the amount of material before and after him. And he lives the gospel. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the gospel. And so we have not only the words that are recorded in a book, we have a life that's lived out. How should we understand the expression the kingdom of God has come now? The Greek language used by Mark in his gospel gives us some clues. In Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, and that is, namely, the kingdom of God has come near. In the Greek, in the Greek it reads, Peplerotai ha kairos kai ingeken he basileia tu thau. The conjunction kai mostly is recognized as a connective, connective element between two words or classes. It's usually translated just as and. And the common translation and in such cases. However, kai can work as an explicative particle, commonly called ex epexegetical kai. It means a word or clause is connected by means of chi with another word or clause to explain what goes before it or, and so. And this is the reflection from the fact that so many of these writers were Hebrew background. And they're used to thinking in parallel things. And all through the Old Testament we see this. Here's an idea, and then there's a parallel idea right following it. An idea, parallel idea. So here, so here's, he's suggesting, uh, therefore, Kai could be translated as, that is, namely, and that's what I did back up here. I read it, read it with that word put it in there. You see, the time is fulfilled. That is, namely, the kingdom of God has come near. In other words, the time is fulfilled because Jesus Christ is here in the body, in the flesh. The Bible study guide continues discussing the meaning of the time is fulfilled. Jim? Thus, if the use of chi in Mark 1, 15 is apex, Epic, apex apexegetic. Apex apexegetic, yeah. The sentence could read as the time is fulfilled. That is, the kingdom of God has come near. In other words, the coming of the kingdom of God means the fulfillment of the time spoken of by Daniel. In this case, Jesus personifies the kingdom of God and such an interpretation is in accordance with the pragmatic point of view of Mark. In Mark 1, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who has come in accordance with the divine prophetic agenda to proclaim the good news about God's kingdom. Thus, the kingdom of God implies the redemption and restoration of humanity. Jesus was asked <clears throat> by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God would come, and he replied, For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Luke 17, 21 from the New American Standard Bible. Okay, let me interrupt there for a second. In uh, Luke 4, verse 16, Jesus is, comes back to Nazareth, and what does he tell his former fellow Nazarenes? I am the fulfillment of that promise. I am the fulfillment of that promise. And they wanted to take him out and throw him down and kill him. I am. And he told that same thing to the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin. And what did they do? They wanted to kill him too. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Paul also seems to support the perspective when he writes, but when the fulfillment of the time comes, time came, 
God sent his son so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 of the New American Standard Bible. So oh, I mentioned that one early, so let's look at it just real quickly. But when the right time finally came, God sent his own son. He came as a son of a human mother and lived under the Jew Jewish law. Okay. I like that. When the fullness of time had come, yeah. we memorized it that way. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. So what jumps out in your mind as being the reason why that was the right time? Because they had a bunch of very cooperative rulers? No. No. A very low point. <laughs> it's a very low point. Why would, I mean, if you'd pick a low point, why didn't God come back just before, well, the time when, when he sent the flood? Wasn't that a low point? What about judges? He allowed the flood. He there was the a, flood was coming. There was a nation that claimed to be following God. Yes. And yet they and their leaders rejected God That's right. in the flesh. Yes, exactly. So here he lived at a time when a lot of, a lot of the rest of the world was high on sin. I mean, they were doing every corrupt thing you can possibly imagine. But then in the midst of them, here's this one nation that claims they're doing everything right. And Paul says himself, a former Pharisee in, in Romans 1 and 2, they were worse, worse than all these other people. Wow. So moving on, what are the secrets of the kingdom of heaven? Let's share if we have the time. Do we? Yeah. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Don't. Why don't you go through the last item there? Okay. The secrets of the kingdom, which is no longer secret because they have been revealed, are not going to be understood by all people. The gospel, the seed, is scattered over all kinds of soils, but unfortunately, not all soils produce the same results. Implicit in this idea is the following notion before Christ gathered together the people for his kingdom in the final harvest at the end of time, he first needs to cast the seed, the gospel, upon the soil. So we conclude, the fulfillment of the time spoken of by Mark and his gospel started when the kingdom arrived in person, that is, Jesus Christ at his first coming. Christ incarnate is the essence of the gospel, the good news. And every village that would welcome him, Christ came to preach about that kingdom. And the, that he came to cast the seeds out, uh, uh, upon the soil and we're coming to an end um, let's pray our kind and loving father we thank you so much for these messages from the book of mark so many implications in almost every sentence there's ideas that are buried and secretly in there help us to understand what's here and, and nourish our spiritual lives with it is our prayer in jesus name amen